Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to be taking a look at human rights and indigenous peoples. My guest today is an expert on both of these topics. My guest is Elifaraja Laltaika of the United Republic of Tanzania. Elifaraja is Executive Director of the Association of Law and Advocacy for Pastoralists and a law lecturer at Tumaini University, Makomiru. Eli Fujara is an expert member of the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for the 2017-2019 period. Eli Fujara, welcome mm -hmm. to today's Global Connections program. Thank you, Bill. Very good to see you again. Okay. We, uh, nice to thank you for having me. We're going to have an update. Yes. <laughs> we did this two years Absolutely, ago. Absolutely, yeah. And I remember back then we were just talking about your appointment to the Permanent yes. Forum on Indigenous yes. uh, Experts. Yes. Uh, what is that group? Uh, give us a little overview of it, and then we'll talk about what you did. Yes. Or what you're doing, I should yes. say, not what you did. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, it starts with the uh, fact that indigenous peoples have struggled uh, for many years to survive as a distinct group. And through their advocacy to the United Nations system, the UN has done two main things. Number one, to express its uh, in institutional commitments. And number two, to really develop some norms or international consensus around standards of treatment for indigenous populations. So if I talk of this first uh, sect of uh, you know, institutional commitments, the UN mm -hmm. has established the three uh, mechanisms uh, that are devoted uh, specifically for the protection of indigenous peoples. And one is called the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Indigenous issues to which I belong. Another mandate is the mandate of the UN uh, Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Mm -hmm. And the other institution is called uh, the Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So these very high level institutions work to advise states as well as uh, the UN systems and its affiliates uh, on the rights of indigenous peoples. Now, I uh, f uh, fall within the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. This is a body that reports to Economic and Social Council, very high because as we know, mm -hmm. ECOSOC mm -hmm. is a charter-based institution as created mm -hmm. by the, the UN Charter itself. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, we are appointed, 16 of us, eight appointed by governments, uh, and, and the eight uh, affiliated to uh, civil society. So the president of the Economic and Social Council appoints 16 experts from a list uh, he or she receives uh, from CSOs as well as from governments. And uh, I was lucky to be appointed uh, 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 two years ago for a three years tenure that expires this year uh, in October. Mm -hmm. uh, so that in a nutshell is the UN Permanent Forum. And it has a uh, uh, work to advise, as I said, the UN uh, system more broadly and its affiliates on uh, uh, spheres uh, or mandated areas. We call them mandated areas uh, that include e economic and social development, environment, human rights, culture, mm -hmm. education, and so on and so forth, and the environment. So what we do, we meet in New York for two weeks. We receive uh, uh, information from delegates attending, uh, states as well as uh, UN agencies and then we develop a set of reports uh, or recommendations uh, saying probably if you want to preserve uh, indigenous languages we as experts uh, think you have you need to do A, B, C, D. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I'm glad you mentioned that because I want to mention their website at www.un.org backslash indigenous. Yes. So if any of our viewers would like to go to that to get more information, Absolutely. they can certainly do that. Yes. And we're going to talk about the forum in just a minute. But yes. before we get off this, I remember last time we talked, two years ago, yes. you mentioned that by being appointed to this group, you mm. were basically the liaison with Africa, which yes. is the second largest continent, Absolutely. the second largest population right Absolutely. behind Asia, yes. which is 54 countries, as yes. I recall. That's a yes. huge area. How did you, how did you f bring that information to help share it with uh, not only people in Tanzania, leaders, yes. uh, policymakers, yes. uh, the general public, the media, yes. different groups like that, but how did you help disseminate that information or maybe interact with indigenous groups in other parts of Africa? 
Thank you, Bill. Uh, th that's uh, yeah. true. Uh, the po appointment works in terms of uh, uh, regions uh, defined uh, in mm -hmm. indigenous peoples' terms. Uh, we have uh, seven regions, uh, African being one. Uh, so the uh, representative of CSOs is one per region, and there's uh, an alternative, uh, alternate uh, position, uh, one position that is uh, uh, taken by uh, one mm -hmm. uh, of the three uh, of the seven regions. So in a nutshell uh, there will be one position for uh, uh, for each region and uh, how it happens that you are uh, probably uh, be able to uh, follow such a huge mandate in a huge area uh, we make use of technology uh, you know we are glad now there's technology you can write emails you can skype you can call uh, uh, advocates on the ground in other parts of the country to tell you uh, uh, the challenges facing them so that i bring them uh, to the attention of the un but most importantly we also have some preparatory meetings where occasionally uh, we get uh, you know uh, the ability uh, and funding and uh, uh, you know facilitation to uh, meet at the regional level and discuss issues that are pertinent at the regional mm -hmm. level another third avenue is usually uh, during the glo global caucus so indigenous peoples have the global caucus so they come ahead of the UN permanent forum session and meet mm -hmm. We usually uh, hosted generously at the uh, church center and then we meet uh, as groups and discuss really and they agree what are key priorities for the region that we can bring to the attention uh, of the UN system. Mm -hmm. yes. I, in the opening I mentioned the human rights, yes. uh, guaranteeing human rights for the yes. indigenous peoples as well as everybody around the world, yes. but that is a very important topic and it's one yes. that's so often overlooked. In your discussions with African leaders and with your colleagues here at the United Nations in this Indigenous Issues Conference, yes. uh, was human rights one of the top issues that you dealt with? Absolutely, it's one of the mandated areas uh, of the UN Permanent Forum. So human rights really uh, forms core of our business. And we discuss them because it's a very cross-cutting issue. Mm -hmm. It touches uh, civil and political rights, economic and social rights, uh, as well as collective rights of indigenous peoples. So uh, really it forms the lifeline of uh, our discussions. Uh, I, I think it, it, it's connected to everything else. And uh, even this year, for example, our theme has been traditional knowledge, but we look at how uh, protection of pr traditional knowledge may enhance uh, protection of other human rights of indigenous communities more broadly. Mm -hmm. w were there any recommendations that came out of the Indigenous Issues Conference at the United Nations that dealt with this? Were there any that you can think of that would focus on that to help promote human rights for indigenous peoples? Uh, absolutely. Uh, they say a very important uh, uh, convention by a UN affiliate, the International Labor Organization, is called uh, the Convention uh, on the Indigenous and Tribal Peoples in Independent uh, States of 1989. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, the anniversary is uh, this year, and therefore it looks like uh, the main recommendation is that uh, states should ratify, should sign and ratify, because it's a very uh, uh, comprehensive uh, uh, international law that uh, puts obligations on states uh, to really uh, implement uh, indigenous people's rights. So mm -hmm. one of the most outstanding uh, discussions and recommendations is really to call upon states to sign and ratify so that they can have binding commitments arising from the ILO convention. And uh, by statistics, for example, is alarming because in Africa is mm. only one country, the Central African Republic, that is ratified. Mm -hmm. So there was a concern that uh, 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 much as we have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples is a very comprehensive, but uh, it uh, is not binding, so we probably need uh, countries to uh, to signify their commitment mm -hmm. to protect indigenous people's rights by really uh, signing and ratifying uh, the ILO Convention 169. Mm -hmm. And another recommendation relates to protection of traditional knowledge and uh, uh, indigenous languages. Uh, so there was a recommendation that the Intergovernmental Council 
uh, this is a group of uh, selected governments representing the, the <coughs> World Intellectual Property Organization, that they should uh, fast track their discussions and negotiations for an uh, instrument, an uh, international mm -hmm. legal instrument for the protection of uh, uh, traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, and so on and so forth. Because um, uh, as matters stand for now, the, the, the intellectual property uh, system protects uh, you know western uh, uh, concepts and it ignores mm -hmm. traditional knowledge and the discussions towards that end uh, have been ongoing in Geneva for uh, I think more than uh, 10 years mm -hmm. and so there was a recommendation that there's a need to fast track that the last one as I say that is also extremely outstanding is the importance of uh, uh, indigenous languages. Uh, I think we had uh, some uh, reports there that uh, two languages are disappearing <laughs> every two weeks. Really? So yeah, we've been uh, here mm. for two weeks, already mm -hmm. uh, two languages have disappeared. So th the United Nations, especially UNESCO, has brought the attention of uh, uh, the UN that uh, we need to preserve indigenous languages because they are transmitters of wisdom, of uh, you know, resilience mm -hmm. practices, mm -hmm. as well as uh, you know, traditional knowledge uh, of communities. So it's very important that we preserve uh, uh, indigenous languages, and therefore there is uh, a discussion around requesting the UN to declare a decade of uh, uh, indigenous languages. And that decade, hopefully, will start. Do you have any idea when it will start? I have no idea, still under discussions, uh, so uh, at least we have the UN year of indigenous languages, which is this year, and mm -hmm. the UNESCO mm -hmm. is coordinating everything. And if we have a decade, I think it will be very, very important because it will give opportunities uh, to governments, as well as the UN agencies, programs, and their affiliates, mm -hmm to really uh, discuss how to save uh, uh, languages that are on the brink of extinction. Because researchers tell us that, uh, uh, you know, the indigenous communities, if mm -hmm. once they lose their language, <laughs> they, have, they lose also the ability to survive in their lands because uh, language is in, uh, very much connected uh, to their mm -hmm. livelihoods and the way they really explain and communicate uh, everything. Yes. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with the PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you have a computer and you like our programs and you want to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided free of charge as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking about indigenous peoples and the major issues that are of importance to them and importance to all of us around the world, such as human rights, climate change, and many others. My guest today is an expert in this areas, area. <coughs> Excuse me. Eli Faraha Laltaika of the United Republic of Tanzania is Executive Director of the Association for Law and Advocacy for Pastoralist and the Lecturer at Tamaini University, Makumira. Eli Fuhara, yes. we've got so many important issues to yeah. talk about and so little time Abs to finish them in. Absolutely. <coughs> one thing I want to, <coughs> excuse me, yeah. one thing I want to uh, mention before I forget it, is that I, I read an article the other day on one of the rapporteurs that issued a, a resolution, or the group did, from this Indigenous Issues Conference here at the United Nations, and that dealt with the decriminalization, or an international campaign to decriminalize Indigenous peoples when they defend their rights to protect their land or whatever the case might be. How important is that in this conversation to them and to what we're talking about today? Absolutely, it's very uh, important, and, and as uh, you have said, the UN Special Rapporteur, uh, which is uh, f falls under an, another mandate, uh, I said there's a permanent forum and the, the Special Rapporteur, as well as the expert mechanism on the rights of indigenous peoples. Now, the UN Special Rapporteur, mm -hmm. currently Madam Vicky uh, Tauli Corpus, has really uh, highlighted uh, uh, an alarming trend where uh, many 
uh, states would criminalize uh, uh, human rights, indigenous people's defenders, human rights defenders, while uh, what these mm -hmm. defenders do is really to defend uh, the environment, water. You know, they press governments for clean water, clean air, uh, to preserve forests because they are habited, uh, by inhabited by communities. But there's a growing trend to really criminalize what they are doing, and so they are taken to jail and others are murdered. Uh, so she has brought to the attention of the international community and there's a huge campaign to really uh, uh, urge states not to treat uh, indigenous uh, human rights defenders as criminals uh, because they are actually helping even the state meet uh, mm -hmm. their international obligations mm -hmm. under human rights and environmental treaties. And uh, I must say it's not only indigenous uh, uh, human rights defenders. This is a huge uh, topic currently mm -hmm. that human mm -hmm. rights defenders are at risk and they say need much as they say declaration to really uh, uh, inform governments that they should not uh, criminalize mm -hmm. uh, activities mm -hmm. of uh, human rights defenders. Mm -hmm. Especially as they're defending their own, not their property per se, but areas where they have lived for eons and eons, Absolutely. centuries and centuries, yes. and this is part of their, their yes. ambiance. It's yes. part of their life, their culture, yes. their geographical area. It's certainly yeah. very important. Yes. Now, if we look at the statistics, uh, indigenous peoples, uh, they're 5% of the world population, roughly. Yes. They are on 22% of the land, roughly, around the world, as mm. far as being distributed, and they have 80% uh, of the biodiversity in yes. their areas. Yes. This is so extremely important. Uh, the majority, or a large number, I would say, yes. are people who live in the Amazon rainforest or perhaps in, in uh, rural areas of whatever different countries where they live. Yes. How important is it for them to be involved in helping to deal, they're, they're the ones who are most adversely affected at the very outset by problems such as climate change, but how important is it for them to be involved in this, which I know they are because they're very concerned about it, and to focus on helping to reverse or at least slow down this horrific climate change debacle that's taking place right now. Yes, uh, I think very important. Uh, you know, as you are, uh, we know, uh, uh, the former Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon mm -hmm. said very well that we don't have planet B. Mm -hmm. uh, Mother Earth is really our only home so far, so we have a huge uh, obligation to really slow down the impact of climate change so that we can all um, co continue existing. Uh, but uh, the main fear among indigenous communities also revolve around uh, mitigation measures that mm -hmm. when c uh, countries want to mitigate uh, impacts of climate change uh, they target their lands and uh, they become victims of uh, forceful evictions i'll give you an example uh, this uh, <coughs> growing consensus that forest to offset carbon and therefore we need to preserve trees to uh, leave them standing and therefore uh, the trend uh, becomes uh, needed to evict uh, uh, communities that live in the forest instead of tapping and benefiting from their traditional knowledge uh, as keepers of the, those forests in the first place uh, we rush and evict them in the name of uh, uh, mitigating mm -hmm. impacts of climate change uh, the other they are not beneficiaries of the uh, exchanges of uh, money and the uh, other resources uh, that are meant to uh, mitigate climate change. Uh, projects would be taken uh, to uh, big cities and so that is what uh, mm -hmm. they are discussing, that they have done least to contribute to uh, climate change in the first place, but they are really at the receiving end uh, of all uh, violations, including attempts to, uh, mm -hmm. to, to mm -hmm. mitigate. Uh, but uh, on the positive side, I think uh, there's also growing consensus that indigenous peoples ha uh, have uh, livelihoods options that are very much compatible to uh, mm -hmm. uh, preservation of the mm -hmm. environment, and therefore they have the solutions uh, to the impacts of climate change. They are should not be treated as a problem. Mm -hmm. No, they're vital. They're a vital component in helping to deal with this problem because Absolutely. they understand it much better <coughs> than we do. <laughs> we who live in urban areas, I Ab should say. Absolutely. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, no. This uh, climate change is, yes. in the opinion of this many scientists and myself, yes. and many other people too, not just me, but 
And this is our number one problem. It's one yeah. that we really have to try to get a handle on. Yes. It, it seems that everybody in every country, every person I've talked to, yes. says that climate change is a major problem. It yes. is happening and it's getting worse. It's yeah. not getting any better. Yes. And so it's one that we've got to focus on. Yeah. It, now, in, um, when you're dealing with these particular issues, what, which, um, how do you plan to continue to push these forward and to keep the ideas going? I know you're involved in many important groups in Tanzania, yeah. but uh, your term will be over at the end of 2019 or yes. in October, I think, or something like yeah. that. Yes. But how do you plan to stay actively involved and to make these issues of importance to your colleagues and yeah. to people uh, all really all around your country and around Africa. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, I totally agree. Uh, climate change is the biggest mm -hmm. challenge of our times. So everyone would really, and as I said, it's very cross-cutting. It affects everything. So it's really uh, the main attention of a lot of uh, actors uh, globally. And uh, we'd continue pushing because uh, how it happens is that uh, <coughs> there are no negotiations under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. So every year around December there's a conference of parties to negotiate mm -hmm. and they agree on how countries can cut their uh, emissions of carbon uh, or agree on the financial mechanisms that would help mitigating the impacts of climate change. And indigenous peoples worldwide have organized themselves around uh, caucus, uh, or, you know, is a forum, uh, indigenous mm -hmm. people's forum on climate change mm -hmm. to really push uh, some of the human rights based uh, aspects to be included in the text. And, uh, you know, I, uh, will continue along those lines, uh, also bringing my expertise uh, mm -hmm. or, uh, uh, and training as an environmental lawyer and a human rights lawyer to really blend and the advice on how we can quickly reach a win-win situation. How do you, how are the pastoralists yes. in Tanzania, how are yes. they dealing with this particular issue? Yes, uh, pastoralists in Tanzania, mm. like pastoralists elsewhere, really inhabit uh, uh, lands that are mm. Uh, <coughs> hostile a little bit. They have uh, resource scarcity. They, 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 and what they do to really make use of uh, that uh, resource scarcity is to move. That is called nomadism. Uh, so to them, uh, the ability to move from a point of resource uh, scarcity to a point of resource abundance is very important. They should have their uh, 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 livestock paths. And what mm -hmm. happens now is that there is a growing population uh, that uh, of also uh, uh, crop growers uh, that causes uh, conflicts. Uh, we also have expansions of cities, expansion of uh, uh, of uh, national parks that uh, is uh, you know reducing the amount of land available for pastoralism. So those are challenges, and they are not uh, really unique to Tanzania. They are also in Kenya and uh, Uganda and elsewhere. So the main challenge for pastoralism. In fact, uh, and which has led to some researchers thinking that uh, is not uh, viable anymore in the 21st century is the rate at which uh, grazing land uh, and water sources, uh, salt lakes, uh, is, is shrinking. And uh, I think mm -hmm. governments are also uh, advised uh, that it's <coughs> important because it constitutes a huge uh, population and the source of GDP. Uh, so in most mm -hmm. Africa, African countries, uh, pastoralism uh, is not some uh, something you can ignore. It needs a lot of uh, uh, policy planning and implementation in order to keep uh, it alive and revitalize, mm -hmm. despite uh, the challenges that I've said of uh, the pro population growth and also expansion uh, mm -hmm. of crop cultivation. Mm -hmm. Well. Eli Furaha Lalte Taika. This is an important topic, and yes. the indigenous peoples have a critical role to play. Yes. They are, uh, as, as w so many people around the world, the people who didn't create the problem of climate change through yes. the use of 
fossil fuels and that type of thing. Yeah. These are the ones who are going to suffer the most. The, yeah. the island states, many of them are suffering right now. The, some of the economically least developed countries are suffering, and the developed countries are certainly, we're the ones who created most of this problem. Mm -hmm. But these are, but we all have a role to play in this, and the indigenous peoples can play a role not only in climate change, yes. but in many, many other areas of importance. And we need to make sure that their rights are guaranteed, they have human rights, and that their voice is heard, and you're certainly doing your part to help do this. But I want to thank you so very much for a very Th interesting and very informative Bill. program. Thank you, Bill. My yeah, pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Thanks thank for you. having me. Thank you. Yeah. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.